built from the ground up specifically for small animals, Allmark offers an MRI solution that provides the highest quality diagnostic imaging with a practical business model and unrivaled support. With over two decades of experience and over 120,000 patient images, Hallmark is committed to providing access to state-of-the-art resources to clinics and practices around the world. Building on their unrivaled success in the equine market, Hallmark's 1.5T small animal MRI system has kept the patient and you at the forefront of every design decision. Your patients range from small to large with anatomy that requires dedicated hardware and software to optimize image quality. With 16 channels to help you see more and scan faster, a V-shaped patient bed, veterinary specific MRI coils and a unique panoramic glass hatch, this self-shielded system delivers the specialized technology your practice demands. A sliding roller system allows for fast patient access in and out of the bore, which minimizes the time the animal is under general anesthesia. Optimum patient positioning is ensured with coils that feature an open top design and a phased array system that enables the use of two coils simultaneously, allowing you to better image hard to reach anatomy. The panoramic glass hatch allows free access to your MRI room during scanning and a dedicated video monitoring system further enhances patient safety. The advanced cooling system is designed to save you precious time and money. This includes a zero boil off cold head that constantly recycles helium and eliminates the need for helium top offs. The air cooled compressor maintains constant helium levels at all times, even if the chiller defaults. Hallmark's world-class QCare service and support program confirms their commitment and encompasses all that they do as a team to support your business success. This includes the Hallmark 99% uptime guarantee, ensuring the care your clients need is available when they need it most. Innovation that works for you. Don't wait to take advantage of the latest technology. Partner with one of the most experienced animal MRI companies in the world. We speak vet at hallmark.net. Hello, everybody. We are live on Facebook Neurology. Thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, myself and Laurent Grossi are proud to introduce Dr. Claire Rushbridge to you. Um, so I'll go through her, her um, extensive uh, biography in a second. I want to thank everyone for turning up. Please, in the chat room, uh, uh, say where you're from. We like to know where everyone's tuning in from. Thanks also to Hallmark and Fans Veterinary Imaging for sponsoring this session. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, so, Claire, thank you very much for um, for giving up your time. I know you're exceptionally busy, as people will uh, probably already know, regardless of, of the bio that I'm about to read, but this kind of reinforces that. So, Claire graduated from the University of Glasgow in 1991 and following an internship at University of Pennsylvania and general practice in Cambridgeshire, she completed a residency and was staff clinician in neurology at the Royal Vet College. She became an ECBN diplomat in 1996, an RCVS specialist in 1999, an RCVS fellow in 2016. She has researched Chiari-like malformation and Syringa myelia for over 20 years. In 2007, she was awarded a PhD from Utrecht University for her thesis on Chiari malformation and Syringa myelia. And in 2011, she received the J.A. Wright Memorial Award by Blue Cross Animal Welfare Charity. Claire joined Fitzpatrick Referrals and the University of Surrey in 2013. Uh, for 16 years prior to this, she operated a neurology and neurosurgery service in Wimbledon. She has authored or co-authored over 140 scientific articles and over 50 of those are in Chiari malformation and syringomyelia. In addition to several book chapters, and she's co-edited a human medical textbook on syringomyelia. So the perfect person to help us out understand what is going on with this very complex disease. Although it seems she might have disappeared on us right now because I'm not sure if I can see I it. It's, it's the only time I wish the, the CV was longer. 
yeah, yeah. I could read it again for those that missed it. <laughs> Just as we seem to have lost her for now. Would you mind um, reading the, all the publication, maybe? <laughs> yeah, maybe. What actually reading them or the titles? Of them. No, the titles. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should go through the titles. So um, we have 140, and I'll start at number one while we wait. For that. <laughs> Okay, well, we will wait for Claire to turn up. She said she's having some internet problems. Um, so we hope that we can get her back online. These are the hazards of live webinars. Um, we hope everyone is doing great anyway. He's back. Here we I'm go. Back. We're back. Oh. The internet went, the internet we were starting to read down, your, unfortunately. <laughs> we we're starting to read the list of your publication. <laughs> I was going to see if we just could read as many as possible before you came back. <laughs> if the internet goes down again, we might have to uh, try and uh, present from uh, my neighbor's house. <laughs> okay, we'll, 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 we'll still be here. Don't worry. <laughs> anyway, we, we've um, given you a fantastic intro, Claire, which you deserve. Thank you very much for giving us the time um, today. Um, and so we're going to get started. And uh, I have a first question to kick you off. Um, if you can share your screen. Oh, we got a freeze. <laughs> All right, great. So our first question is that, is that over the last 20 years or 20 years ago, really, the veterinary profession has described Chiari malformation as as just being a cerebellar herniation. But now we know that it describes a malformation of the entire cranium and craniocervical junction as well. Uh, can you help us understand how the pathogenesis of, of canine Chiari has changed in our understanding of that? Um, so, Chiari malformation has um, went from 20 years ago being described as, as a cerebellar herniation to something that we understand as a global skull and cranial cervical um, vertebrae problem. And it was named, um, really it was a, it's a the, the problem with the name is it's the result of being part of a committee. It was nobody really liked the name Chiari like malformation, but it seemed like the best alternative given that we didn't really understand at that stage um, what it all entailed. And Hans Chiari himself originally described uh, Chiari malformations as being associated with a cerebellar herniation, even though it was an eclectic group of four different conditions without any relationship to each other. So that's why it's got its horrible, eponymous name. Um, and it is associated on, in the most part with a cerebellar herniation. But it's one of these conditions, that the more that you investigated it, the more you found and we're still looking and still finding things and uh, in more recent times it's been much more uh, uh, realized that not only is it a whole global frame problem but it also involves uh, the nasal passages or at least loss of them and i'd like you to can you still see my arrow there yeah yeah i'd like you to observe and hear this dog with mild chiari malformation and no sphingomyelia how the dog has uh, a, a gentle stop here, but in this dog, we've lost that nasal tissue. We've lost the frontal sinus. Um, and that's really very important with the pathogenesis, probably for two reasons. The first is it's associated with even less room for the brain. You get this frontal lobe flattening and, and a reduction of the olfactory bulbs, and they take a more ventral position. But it's also probably important because um, the olfactory area, the olfactory mucosa, is one of the most important sites for absorption of the CSF lymphatics, sorry, the CSF fluid. Now, uh, we have to sort of lose this old wives' tale that CSF is absorbed for the arachnoid granulations. Yes, they, they, do, they can absorb um, CSF, but it's not the primary site. The primary site of CSF absorption is through lymphatics, through the nasal mucosa and in the skull base. And when you reduce that, you probably reduce the surface area and absorbing capacity of that and put, as I said, the animal into a pro-ventricular dilatation and syringomyelia state. The arachnoid granulations are important, but they kind of think of them as more like an overflow valve rather than 
um, rather than uh, the primary site. And of course, the lymphatics associated with the nerve roots uh, and thrillers of heart vessels are also important. The other thing that um, is, is very important for this disease is the displacement of the brain. So we get this frontal lobe flattening and then we get the forebrain pushed backwards, um, pushed cordially. And see how the cerebellum is, is invaginated underneath the occipital lobes. Compare the two dogs here. We can see in this dog, we see the cerebellum sticking out the back of the, of the brain. I mean, that's what we expect. The, sort of, the cerebellum is caudal to the forebrain in dogs anyway. But look at this one. Look how it's sort of really pushed in under there. That's partly because the supraoccipital bone is so flat. Compare the occipital crests in these dogs. See the occipital crest here? See the supraoccipital bone is rounded and coming out the back. See the occipital crest here? Boom, straight down, flat. Now look at the uh, atlas. The atlas is right there, pushing in on that coral cerebellum, pushing down on that, that spinal cord. It is there as well, but it's got a little bit more space because at least it's rounded. The atlas doesn't normally sit right next to the skull. You go and look at any big dog and you find that um, um, they've got a massive space in, in, in between there. One other important feature is the cisterna magna. See how it's not very big there, but, but it's, quite, it's quite reasonable size. And you can see the uh, arachnoid space around it. See this dog? Tiny. And that's really important because the cisterna magna acts as a kind of reservoir a pressure reservoir that helps buffer that CSF uh, flow. And the absence of it, as we're looking in a couple of slides more, is, is really important. The next thing that's important is the de degree of flexure. Notice that this dog is a pretty much straight line. I can put a ruler through there and it's a straight line. In this dog, either kinking, variously called medullary um, elevation or medullary kinking. And it's because there's a kind of concertina of the tissue in this uh, in this area through this reduced volume region um, because all of these are so crowded uh, close together and it's the combination of these two things that's important for the pathogenesis of syringomyelia the combination of brachycephaly and of cranial cervical junction uh, obstruction and with Chiari, like malformation associated with pain, you just have the brachycephaly. The syringomyelia, you have the combination of the two. We're going to look at this in another, another image. And this one's a moving one because I, I like my movies. I'm quite a visual person. I like to see uh, in, real t uh, in a more realistic demonstration of how things changing. And what you're seeing here is a morph going from a normal cavalier, which is illustrated on um, on the left side here, we, we, we describe that as CMMN, N standing for normal, because we know that all Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, for example, have a degree of, uh, of Chiari malformation. And that's moving through the spectrum of Chiari malformation associated pain through to the most severe, which is syringomyelia associated signs um, or symptomatic, if you're allowed to use that word, uh, syringomyelia. And I think in this, you can really see how things change, how the nose is, is uh, conformation changes. We can see how these are the two dogs here illustrated. And this dog is a dental tapering. This dog is 14 years old. Um, uh, her last MRI imaging was at seven. You can see that in the, in the previous images. Um, and uh, um, and this is uh, our, our syringomyelia affected uh, dog, and you can see gorgeously cute. But look at that little that very sharp angled stop here. I'd like to also point out the changes in the soft palate. And we talk about a long soft palate in these dogs. I would describe it as more of a thick U-shaped palate. And you've only got to to understand this when you when you ask owners of Chiari uh, malformation affected dogs whether their dogs snore and i can pretty much guarantee that yes they they all snore um so these are the sort of changes that we're seeing um and this is illustrating it in a um in a chihuahua um and uh chihuahua siblings actually so we have the um uh this is the normal sibling and she was being screened so no clinical signs and now morphing into her sister 
um, uh, I'd have to thank my son actually for make, drawing these. And you can see her sister. I think it really illustrates when I talk about that cervical flexion, you may not quite believe me until you see these images of this dog morphing between, its, between the siblings of how different those two are. Notice also how the change in the conformation of their, of, of their stop. Um, as it comes out here, you can see again how um, we have this more obtuse angle here morphing into a right angle of the affected sibling. You also get this increase in height of the brain, obviously the open skull, um, uh, uh, which has been very nicely uh, described from colleagues in, in Finland. And also notice how you get loss of this supraoccipital bone, uh, the so-called occipital dysplasia. It's likely that this bone never ossified in the first place, or possibly that, that was lost due, to, due to, to pressure. But that's a very important feature because not having that bone to press against does um, change uh, the way that uh, the, the cerebellum looks in these dogs. The final feature is I'd like to, you to notice how the, the change of the, um, of, of the, um, uh, um, the uh, bends here, how it is, I'm not sure if you can see that little hand going up there, how it is pushing up into, into the spinal cord, how that conformation changes. So I think this really illustrates really just how complicated um, this disorder is. And it's not a case of having one feature. It's a case of having A, maybe two of B, a little bit of C and some D that causes the disease in, in, in one dog. Um, and and uh, in another dog, it may be two of A, a little bit of B, quite a lot of C. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a wide spectrum. Um, so hopefully it's going to go on to the next slide. Yes, now I've gone too far. So I'd like to dwell a little bit further on these craniosomarchal junction abnormalities and, and just point out the difference here between these, this, this chihuahua in an MRI scan and in a CT scan. And this dog was reported as not having a Chiari malformation, and that was because the, um, uh, the, the, the radiologist looking at it didn't really see much of a cerebellar herniation. But look again, look, this is the bottom of the supraoccipital bone in this dog. Everything else is a membrane coming down, uh, including the membrane that goes between the supraoccipital bone and the atlas. And uh, the atlas, look, is look how far inside the skull this dog's atlas is. I mean, imagining the line of the bone would be coming down. It should be down there. So this, this atlas is invaginated into the skull. And the reason why the cerebellum isn't herniated is it can't actually get out. There's no, there's no space for it to come out. And this is actually a very severe Chiari malformation, which you may have taken a casual glance at that, knowing what you know about um, Cavaliers, and for oh, there isn't a Chiari malformation there. Also look at the, the uh, medulla and uh, going into the spinal cord. This is really kinked. Again, you can't really get the impression of it so well because it's so um, uh, crushed, but I think you can really see that trying to get nervous tissue out through this tiny little hole, that this, this dens is going to be poking up into, uh, into that uh, medulla area, a so-called, um, uh, they would call this basal invagination in humans. Um, and we can really see how close those atlases are when we compare some, some um, uh, normal dogs. So here's an Australian terrier. I just pulled that out as being a normal terrier. And we can see the occipital crest here and quite a large space, but illustrated by the blue area, arrow. Then we have a normal griffon. And again, we can see a normal uh, space. And then we see a, a, an affected griffon bruxellois. And there's hardly any space between the occipital crest and the atlas. And, and I know this is a, 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 a talk on imaging. Um, and it's mainly focused on MRI and, and CT, but I'd like to point out sometimes people do take radiographs of this. And this dog I knew had syndromyelia just on the basis of the radiograph that was taken, because you can really see how wide the canal is here and how scalloped C2 is because of this gradually expanding series in this dog. And of course, we also have this um, uh, beaten copper 
uh, appearance of the of the skull associated with ventricular megaly. So with these cranial cervical abnormalities, we see a number of different uh, things, but dorsally angled dens. Um, and medullary kinking and the C1 being close to the occiput is the most important. The dural bands have been described. You see them more when the dog's head is in extension, which sort of makes sense, but um, hasn't been uh, um, correlated with, um, with disease as yet. I wanted to show you some Persians. And these were, um, this was some nice work being done by uh, Martin Schmidt on the Persian, showing a coronal um uh, a suture craniosynostosis something you really these these cats do look like they've run into a bus or things and we've got the sort of normal back of the skull here and then it just looks like it's just missing chopped in half um and uh, and this massive foreshortening of the brain so they have a chiari malformation in the traditional sense of the word with a cerebellar herniation but but why don't they have swing myelia? Well, I think the answer is that they do generally have a cisterna magna. So they have that important buffering uh, area in the subarachnoid space. They do generally have a normal subarachnoid space for a cat. Uh, and, their, and their atlas isn't as close to the, um, to the skull um, as, the, um, as the cavalier. So though they have this massive foreshortening, they just don't have that hind skull and craniosurvacal junction abnormalities. The other thing I think is interesting is their olfactory bulb surface area. And you can see these are all neurologically normal Persians, I should say they came in for other reasons. Um, and uh, you can see that this is pretty normal size olfactory bulbs there. And even in these cats, you can actually see on the CT where it doesn't look like they've got uh, proper olfactory bulbs, you can actually see that they're they, they too, they sort of extend into the nasal area in a most interesting and unusual way. And I also hypothesize that this might help with their CSF absorption, although of course we can see quite a marked ventricular dilatation. And of course these cats are also prone to quadrigenal system expansion. So this is the point you asked me another question, Simon, and I went yeah. on to well, no, 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 fantastic. I, I love those moving pictures. Your your son needs to be credited for that. It's fantastic. Um, uh, so, yeah, let's talk about some clinical signs. Uh, uh, there's a new realization that you brought to the fore that Chiari-like malformation associated pain is a diagnosis in its own right. So um, can you talk us through then the typical MRI picture of this? Yes. Um, so... It was really the breeders and the, and, the, and the owners that were telling us this. Um, and I don't know why we didn't think that this would be the case because Chiari malformation is a very painful disease in, in humans. But I think we all thought that, uh, that um, because we saw so many cavaliers with Chiari malformation that we should just ignore it and that they weren't abnormal. And it's certainly true that many dogs with Chiari malformation are clinically normal, but we do see some dogs with very severe signs of pain. And what is that spectrum? Well, I'm trying to show it in this rather busy slide, but the purpose of it really is to take my, my uh, rugby football and soccer ball analogy a little bit further. So you can see here in the normal dog, that we have a, a, a sort of rugby ball shape. Um, I think you'll have to forgive me that it does have a pointy bit. But as it goes further along here, you see the brain, the outline of the brain becomes rounder and rounder and rounder. This is the forebrain. So it's getting progressively crushed. And this is what I mean by, by um, uh, uh, having uh, a more extreme uh, brachycephaly. And you can see here in the normal, this is the line of the, uh, of the um, stop and getting pro progressive reduction. And again, you can see the tilting of the brain illustrated by this white line. And also you can see um, the, how the kinking of the, of the brain, uh, called a craniosurvical junction, is occurring as you get progressively before syringomyelia. The challenge we have, however, and I'm going to illustrate that in another slide, uh, is, is really how do you tell the difference between normal and Chiari-associated pain? I think it's quite easy to see when I, I, I bring out our uh, true normal, or the, the, we like to illustrate normal, but this dog here uh, in the second thing is also 
normal, according to the owner, no, no obvious clinical signs. Um, and I think that if I was to put both of you in front of, uh, in front of you and asked you to tell you which one was the dog with severe signs, I think you would struggle, I would struggle. The only real difference is, is, is possibly this angulation of this green line here. But really you need some kind of comparison uh, software to be able to do it, which is one of the reasons why we're, I'm very interested in developing an AI interpretation of these. It was really challenging, and why might that be? Well, there may be other reasons why you develop uh, pain, other factors, because as I said before, we're constantly learning, constantly coming up with other things that may be important, or there may be other um, uh, issues. For example, it may be to do with uh, how much uh, meningeal fibrosis you've developed, or it may be due to your pain processing. Interestingly, one of the loci we found uh, when looking at the genetic cause of this wasn't a loci for brain development or or, or skull development, it was a low cipher uh, 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 looking at transmission of, of, of neurological information, processing of, new, of, of information, and, and had been associated with neuropathic pain. So it may be that the dogs we see just are more likely to get painful. It also may be that we see this dog at one point in its life and it's not painful, we don't know what it was like a couple of years later. So, Neuromalformation associated pain, it's a, it's a challenging um, a diagnosis. And really, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Yes, um, you can find some features on an MRI. And I would compel you when you're describing your MRIs and your MRI reports, you really need to um, uh, describe a lot of features, I think. I think it's no longer su uh, sufficient to say it had Chiari malformation. Because the person reading that doesn't know if you just mean that it's got cerebellar herniation. Um, or whether you mean other features. So I think it would be useful for you to start pointing out other features. Some of the features in here, for example, is that there is um, a, a reduction in the sulci. You see there in the red dot compared to this dog, suggesting that they've been flattened. That's not normal. Obviously, there is some ventricular dilatation in this dog. It's all ventricles, including the fourth ventricle, which suggests the obstruction through the lateral aperture. I know we get a lot of dogs that are completely normal with ventricular dilatation, but it should still be re reported. And of course, the other features like absence of stop, um, sorry, a very pr um, pronounced stop, absence of, of, of frontal sinuses, brachycephaly, craniosolical kinking, these are all useful things. Other than that, you have to take a careful history. Animals with Chiari malformation associated pain often show postural pain. So that means yelping or refusal to change rapidly, um, change posture, so, such as refusal or difficulty jumping or doing stairs or yelping when they're getting up or yelping when you pick them up under their chest and pop them onto a table is very common. They may also spontaneously yelp, especially at night. And that's because and I, I like to ask people with Chiari malformation what their signs are, because I feel that I, I then can understand better about what's going on with the dogs. And um, uh, they, they often say that, yes, they wake up with an absolutely pounding, bang, 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 bang pain at night that can cause them to want to, to scream out. Are you still there, guys? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it normally sounds like a washing machine in the background and the washing machine doesn't have gone. Um, so the, um, uh, these dogs um, uh, often scream out at night. And I always wondered why that was. And then eventually I found some references that told me that you, that you do get some swelling of your brain during sleep. Uh, and when you stand up, this is humans, of course, I, I have to assume it's the same as dogs, although that's a bad thing to do. When you stand up, uh, gravity allows that fluid to come away from your brain. So your brain is basically a bit more swollen in the morning, more likely to have pain. These dogs also have spinal pain, about 50% of them. But strangely enough, it's not always in the cervical area. It can be thoracolumbar or even lumbar sacral. And typically, it's a poorly localized pain, whereas this pain, you know, you put the, your fingers on the, on the vertebrae, and oh, oh, they're very, you can localize it to a very precise area. This is more like a, a, a hunching or a tension, tension. If you've got a headache, you're not going to want to exercise, especially if that increases your systolic pulse. Um, and, and so they often have an exercise intolerance and reduced activity. 
They may scratch or rub their head or their ears, but this is not phantom scratching. Um, they may have a behavioral change. I mean, if you had a headache, you wouldn't want another dog to come and bounce on top of you. So you may start to show aggression towards those dogs or even a human. You may become more anxious or withdrawn. Aversion to touch is fairly obvious. I was quite surprised at how many of them um, had sleep disruption and nighttime restlessness. Again, not, un not unusual. For this, though, I mean, these are vague signs. And so to get a diagnosis of acute malformation associated pain, you must rule out other explanations of pain, head scratching, behavioral changes, sleep disturbance. So in that way, getting an MRI scan may not be helpful because you can't confirm a Chiara malformation associated pain from an MRI. Um, you can only help support your diagnosis. Um, so moving on at this at this stage to talk a bit more about syringomyelia we know that that's not always clinically relevant or the finding of that anyway can, can you talk us through some of the relevant features of imaging of syringomyelia and how that relates to the clinical signs yes yeah, so the way i describe syringomyelia and we're not going to go into the pathogenesis too much of it but uh, um well not, not really at all but uh, come to ECBN if you want to know that, uh, is that uh, you get this uh, um, dilation first of the central canal and the surrounding area, um, and it begins to expand the spinal cord, but it's a bit like a donut, a donut with a hole in it, not one with the stuff with jam that we use to describe a disc, but a different type of donut. So the donut with the ring, and it's still a cake, it still fulfills all its cake-like functions. And so you have this sort of hole in the middle and then, uh, and then a, a normal spinal cord on the outside. And these dogs may not have clinical signs. I'd also like to, um, to remind you, you know, some of Natasha Olby's uh, work in uh, North Carolina showed that you can really, that those dogs can walk on surprisingly little spinal cord. Um, that you can you can uh, still have some function. We've all seen those dogs with vaccines with with the, that are still walking. And you look at their imaging after the MRI when they come in for their next disc because you didn't properly fenestrate them. You see this great big gliotic area. And you think how is this dog still walking? Well, the uh, the thing is that uh, syringomyelia they often are not paralyzed. It's extremely rare to get par paralysis, and that's because the white matter tracks tend to be preserved on the outside enough for, for walking. So clinically relevant syringomyelia, it causes a myelopathy, spinal cord disease. You may think, oh, stating the blinking obvious, Claire. Yes, well, I am. But that's because sometimes people think this disease is associated with things like facial nerve paralysis or epilepsy or fly catching. And it's not. Syringomyelia causes a spinal cord problem, a myelopathy. And like any myelopathy, the neurolocalization of that will correspond to the damage done by the syringomyelia. So one of the things you need to do is to assess the spinal cord and the syrinx where it's going through its widest point. You need to take transverse sequences. A wide syringomyelia in a cavalier means four millimeters or more. I'm afraid I haven't worked it out for other breeds, but I would say that, that, that Yorkie is probably smaller than that and a uh, French Bulldog is comparable. So really, it's going to be wide before I start thinking, yes, this syringomyelia could be corresponding with some clinical signs. Now, one thing we I haven't been able to determine is how much uh, syringomyelia can, can contributes to the pain. Um, because we can see some dogs with syringomyelia that are surprisingly non-painful and some that are very severely painful. And that's why I, I pay more attention to Chiari and call it Chiari malformation associated pain. It's undoubtedly associated with pain in some animals, but I'm going to talk about the other specific signs that you get with syringomyelia. And really it really comes down to like most neurology, location, location, location. And the first one is that in Cavaliers, it often dissects asymmetrically into the outer area of the spinal cord, into the 10 and the two o'clock position, into the area of the gray matter associated with the cervical dorsal horn, um, superficial dorsal horn. And in its, when it's in the cervical area, between segments two and five in particular, it seems to interfere 
with the uh, control of scratching. And this is where you can get phantom scratching. Now, phantom scratching is not scratching at both ears. It is not scratching at the belly. It is definitely not nibbling the feet. And it's definitely, definitely not nibbling the bottom or nibbling the back feet. It is very, very specific scratching towards the neck area. And you should be able to induce it by rubbing the corresponding dermatone associated with the spinal cord segment that is having the dorsal horn affected. It also is triggered by contact from um, uh, uh, the leash and the collar and harness, and also they will do it when they're excited, typically in the morning. Um, and often they make a sort of rhythm, well, they do make a rhythmic action without contact, and it's most similar to the fictive scratching that was first described by Sherrington after he transected uh, spinal cords. The other thing you can get with superficial dorsal horn um, uh, damage is um, a, a scoliosis, or probably what's more correct is a cervical thoracic torticollis. You get the head down on the opposite side to the superficial dawn, horn um, um, involvement, and the shoulder is out ipsilateral. And, you know, it seems obvious when I put the pictures there, but a, a great many vets have have um, understandably mistaken that for a head tilt. And there was one vet that, that uh, uh, and the owner was quite insistent that it was a shoulder luxation. So when they're so deformed at that, it sometimes can be quite uh, difficult to appreciate that that's a scoliosis associated with gray column damage. If they have extensive dorsal column involvement, and they may have mild pelvic limb proprioceptive deficits and weakness. And this is much more typical of breeds like the French Bulldog. The French Bulldog, um, they can get the dissection into the superficial dorsal horn, but um, uh, it's uh, um, much more common they have dorsal horn uh, involvement. Why that occurs? Well, uh, it's probably due to the conformation of the spinal canal. Again, if you want to have more on that, maybe come to ECVN. Nice plug for them. Um, so, the, 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 again, you can, you can think, how can a dog have such a thin spinal cord and still be walking? Well, they will still be walking. Paralysis is not a feature of Sphingomyelia. This dog had degenerative myelopathy. Yes, it occurs in Cavaliers. It's actually quite common. If it starts to affect the, the, the um, cervical intumescence, gray matter, then you'll get thoracic limb signs. Remember, the classic sign of sphingomyelia is a central spinal cord syndrome. I remember that means gray matter affected more severely, thoracic limbs are weaker. Um, and so they get these thoracic limb weakness, stumbling, are uh, falling, proprioceptive deficits on the thoracic limbs, with the pelvic limbs su surprisingly pr preserved. And they can also have um, this uh, 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 core muscle weakness, um, uh, as you illustrated in this dog. I'm not sure if you can see that or not, but uh, um, I put this in to show this development in the uh, cervical thoracic area. This is very typical of French bulldog chihuahuas, Yorkshire Terriers, they may not have a big syrinx in this uh, cranial cervical area, which is why it's important to image at least down to the cervical thoracic region. Um, but syrinx is, can sometimes burst, and this shows a bleb that was um, uh, probably, um, it was outside the spinal cord, but within the pia. Uh, and I have actually seen them completely burst and the, and the spinal cord collapse with a temporary improvement in signs, which is rare, but can, can occur. Oh, thank you very much. You have mentioned already um, some differences between breeds, but why don't you talk us through um, referring to Kari like malformation and syringomyelia, how it's different between uh, the French Bulldog Chihuahua and then the Griffon Bruxellois. So here I have a, a handy comparison between them all, and they are different. I mean, we probably shouldn't say that it's the same disease even. Um, sometimes I sort of change and say it's syringomyelia associated with brachycephaly um, in something like the, the French Bulldog, for example, because in the French Bulldog, you really don't see the changes in the cerebellum really because they have a smaller cerebellum uh, compared to the to, to the Cavalier, most likely. This was the work done from the Royal Veterinary College. And in the French Bulldog, it's really 
characterized by extreme brachycephaly and aerorynchy, loss of the uh, loss of the nose. And um, one of the more consistent features with them is that the occipital crest, you see the occipital crest coming at the back here, it's so far behind the supraoccipital bone. So if you didn't believe me that this dog is brachycephalic, even for a French bulldog, then this is what's really showing it because a lot of these dogs they, uh, that are normal, they tend to have a more normal back of the back of the skull. So extreme brachycephaly with the French bulldog, and a tendency for the syringe to develop in the thoracic region. Yeah, I know I can see the uh, the, the heavy vertebrae there, but even without that, it t tends to develop in this region. They present with thoracic limb weakness, and they may have little or no uh, syringe in the. Uh, in the uh, um, uh, cervical region. We do see it in crossbreeds, and I've deliberately uh, uh, put in some crossbreeds here. So the Cavapoo, the most popular breed of breed type of dog in, uh, in this year. Uh, they, can't, they can't breed them fast enough. Anything with a heartbeat is being bred to make a, to make a, a Cavapoo. And uh, we do see it in, in this breed. And, um, and basically, your only way, safe way to, to breed a Cavalier and a Poodle together is to breed the Cavalier to a much, much bigger Poodle, um, or to have much, much more Poodle um, rather than Cavalier. Because the problem is Cavaliers generally have a big brain, and it's just too big for that, for that skull. Again, you can see with this dog, very no, absolutely no frontal sinus. It goes skin, skull, brain. Um, very extreme brachycephaly, a lot of kinking here, dens sticking up into the medulla, very tight here. That's the base of the supraoccipital bone there. Some people uh, might mistake it and think it's there. No, nope, that's the atlas sticking into the, into the cerebellum. In the Chihuahua, this is the dog I showed you before. So um, uh, again, we have this sort of extreme brachycephaly, Eventually, the olfactory bulbs are pointing down to the earth rather than um, uh, in, uh, out to the side. Um, and then this extreme overcrowding is really a feature of these, this, uh, these dogs. The cerebellar herniation um, may not be apparent uh, because, of the, um, uh, because of the fact it can't actually get out. Um, and again, with the griffon broussauvois again, it, it, the cerebellar herniation may not be a great feature, but the kinking is. And again, the extreme brachycephaly with the olfactory bulbs really ventral and the complete absence of a nose. Oh, fantastic. Um, so moving on from there, uh, how does syringomyelia change over the years or, or, or are there any prognostic factors to look for? So one of the myths about syringomyelia um, is that when it develops, it will progress in a linear fashion. Um, and so the, a dog that you see when it's one year old will have a much bigger syrinx when it's three and a much, much bigger syrinx when it's nine. But that doesn't appear to be the case. It seems um, that syringomyelia can really develop really quite rapidly in some cases. I'm sure some, some people have seen massive syringomyelia secondary to um, brain tumors, which have caused a, 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 um, a, a displacement of the brain quarterly um, uh, with a frame magnum herniation. And you think, gosh, that's a massive syrinx, how quickly it's developed. Um, and uh, uh, there is, we have been, done, been doing some computer modeling on, um, on, on these dogs based on the MRIs, making the model, and also of observation. And uh, it seems that uh, based on observation, that the syrinxes uh, develop quite rapidly uh, in many dogs, but then they reach a state of, I call it probably incorrectly, hydrodynamic equilibrium, where they stay remarkably static over years and years. Um, and uh, um, this has also been represented in the modeling, where you can see pressure changes very, very severe at first, but then the pressure drops off and they go into a much more low pressure state. So if you're interpreting this on an MRI scan, this is a dog at eight months old and at three years of age. And I'll point you out um, uh, two relevant features. The first of all is the artifact, this fluid void. 
Now, we're used to seeing that in, in high uh, field scanners, this black area within the syrinx, and that re represents where CSF used to be, no longer is. Um, it's, it's now left the plane and has no longer been picked up by the receiving coil, so it comes as a black void. Well, we should use that in our interpretation. We shouldn't just say, oh, there's an artifact. We should say, hey, that fluid was moving at really high velocity. Um, and so seeing that fluid void for me shows me that that is probably a developing syrinx, that that has got, that fluid is sloshing about and the syrinx is at high risk of expansion. I'm going to point out this other image here. This is more of a free syrinx. This is more edema uh, that is in this region here, not an established syrinx. The other bit that I'd like to point out is those bulkai. And the, can you see, you can't really see the gyra at all. You can't really see them. They're all occluded, suggesting this brain is, um, is say, I hesitate to say swollen, but should we say expanded? The CSF state is reduced to the extent that you've occluded the small kind, which is obviously abnormal. And it's particularly apparent in the fore, uh, in the rostral part of the forebrain, less apparent in the olfactory or in the occipital lobe. But here it is three years later. <laughs> is it that bad? <laughs> you have to throw, destroy your studio. Don't worry, I'm your team. <laughs> um, so the, um, uh, you can see this is probably one of the worst cases of syringomyelia I've got. It extends right down to the conus, really, really bad. However, actually, surprisingly enough, this dog had less clinical signs at this stage. And that's probably because it is at a lower pressure. Look how the, uh, the sulci now are, um, are, are really quite apparent, and we don't have as much fluid void. So this dog did have clinical signs, but wasn't actually in as much pain. And that is why you can't use the clinical status of the dog to judge how your surgery did without doing an MRI scan, because the dogs don't necessarily progress. A lot of them do, but they don't necessarily progress with their, with their clinical signs. Of course, this dog was on a lot of medication as well. So prognostic signs, the fluid void, absence of gyra, perhaps a developing syrinx of a pre-syrinx, uh, pre and, um, and established syrinxes are expanding the spinal canal, perhaps less fluid void, um, and uh, more established gyra. Um, the uh, syrinx probably expands pretty rapidly in the first years of life. But once they get to about three years of age, it, it often remains, not always, but often remains very static. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, finally, um, do you have a slide uh, information you can share on your MRI protocol for syringomyelia for the people so tuning in? There are two slides, which I'm a, is quite busy, but I'm assuming people want to screenshot them. But if you don't, I've got some papers at the end which show them. So I'm not going to read them out um, because uh, if there is any time at the end, I'd like to maybe take uh, a couple more questions. Um, I'm just going to let uh, people, hopefully they have got their phones out and they're screenshotting them now. Otherwise, I can, uh, I guess, end up copy. They can think, always, so. always go back to the, the uh, recorded back, yeah. version. And here is another version here. This is really, this is the, this is the standard imaging. And then this is the what also to do. So um, you should give paramagnetic uh, magnetic contrast if there's evidence of a mass, because it may be a suspect tumor. Uh, and also if, there, if the cause of the CSF obstruction is not apparent. Steady state sequences, these are things like Fiesta um, or um, pre cis should be used if your machine can do them if the cause of the CSF panel is not apparent. Syringomyelia is a bit like anemia. It's not a diagnosis in itself. We need to establish why there is syringomyelia. Um, and this dog you can see here, there isn't an obvious frame of magnum obstruction. So what is going on here, it's difficult to tell. When we do a steady state um, as this, we can see that there's an adhesion up here. And actually this is um, a retinoid uh, diverticulum of some kind. Also, if it's a purebred dog, then please um, uh, make sure you include the microchip number on it. 
uh, because maybe the owner will come back to you and say that they want to uh, put that dog in for scanning. Um, especially if it's, it comes back normal, actually. Sorry, put that in dog in for screening because they want to breed it. And it's always um, better if you put it on in, 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 in plants that causes quite some problems trying to prove that that was the dog that you scanned afterwards. So uh, I did have a couple more slides if you had time for a question, but I realised that I've massively overrun by not being able to connect to the internet earlier. Okay, I think I mentioned to... Um when we were, you know, uh, filling the, the, the space about that you have some MRI of post-op. I think everyone would be quite interesting to see them, uh, Claire, if you don't mind. Okay. All right. Well, this is the first one. Oh, follow up. So, um, this is uh, um, a dog with hydrocephalus. I think people can appreciate that. Um, and uh, so it's not uh, swing myelia, but the point is that if you have very dilated ventricles, then placing and clinically relevant um, hydrocephalus, then it may be um, a, 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 the best option for you is to place an interventricular shunt. Although bearing in mind that that can have about a 25% complication rate, uh, and in this uh, type of dog, um, a subdural bleed being the most important. I'd like, you to, I'd, I'd like to point out to you the massive fluid void that's occurring in the third ventricle going through the mesencephalic aqueduct. Uh, this dog had obstruction through the lateral aperture, uh, apertures here. Uh, I think you can really appreciate this is surging fluid. Um, and uh, you can also see the, the massive uh, syringomyelia, but also how that syringomyelia is just gone. And that, I think, is really quite amazing. And this is what scans look like in humans that have had successful frame and magnum decompression. So they talk about frame and magnum decompression being effective in about 80% of humans. Well, that's what they mean, that collapse of the syrinx. And that means that the syrinx is no longer filling. The syrinx isn't a static full of, of, full of stagnant fluid that developed, that developed when the dog was, was a puppy and has remained there ever since. It's actively filling and emptying quite a, um, and so, when you see it expanded, it means it's actively filling. Here is um, uh, images that I have to thank Anna Toro for. She uh, did the surgery um, uh, with me and inspired me to do it. I don't think I would have had the bravery to do it otherwise. Uh, she was the one who encouraged me. Um, and we placed a shunt into the syrinx. In actually, in the dog we showed you before with the arachnoid adhesions, and then put it into the pleura. Uh, quite a few people ask me why the pleura. Oh, well, that's really going back to the to the human uh, neurosurgeons that I've had the fortune to spend some time with, and they say that there is no right reciprocal for CSF fluid. It's just the closest reciprocal. Um, so, um, uh, and the pleura was the closest to the neck. And the other reason was that the uh, catheter didn't stretch down to the peritoneum, so we really had had no choice. Um, I found this a very scary surgery. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, putting the shunt in there, um, and uh, of course the scariest bit was doing the thoracotomy and putting the shunt in the, in the chest, like any any good neurologist, but absolutely terrified of, of going near other cavities. Um, but it eventually had a, a good outcome, this dog, and you can see the full story uh, published um, in that journal below. So this is one of um, my recent surgeries. This dog came back for its six-month uh, postdoc um, a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so um, it has a, had, I do a gerotomy and a C1 laminectomy, um, and you can see that there. So the, the, the superoxidable bone is missing in the center there, and you can see the loss of, of C1. And I'll also cut the dura and tack it up. Um, and uh, I've always been very honest um, and said that the syrinx doesn't really change. Uh, I think if you were being extremely kind to me, and you'd have to be extremely kind, you'd say that perhaps the syrinx was less obvious here compared to here. But I think you do have to be very kind because, of course, I'm not going to take the same section through the spinal cord exactly the same each time. But the dog is much, much better. The owner is, is very happy um, because the dog was uh, uh, not controlled on medication and now she's using much less medication. Why? Because the Chiari malformation pain is probably addressed. Um, and so uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the lack of, uh, of um, uh, improvement of movement here that is probably making the difference. 
Um, and uh, of course, as I've said before, the Syrinx can remain remarkably unchanged. So it may remain static anyway, despite surgery. The fact is expanded means that it's filling. Um, and so we can't judge uh, improvement with surgery on the basis that the Syrinx hasn't, um, hasn't um, uh, changed and remains static. And this is I have to acknowledge my boss. This is one of the a few uh, free of magnum decompressions with titanium mess. He did, he, he did do gerotomy and no C1 laminectomy. Um, and this dog was also much, much better um, uh, when he was on medication um, uh, after the surgery. So again, this made a, a lot of difference. But again, you can see that the sleptomyelia is still present. I followed that dog over many, many years. Um, um, uh, this was quite some time ago, and that syrinx um, remained very static, but the dog did um, have a deterioration in, in, in clinical signs. Whether or not this surgery is better, I think, is, is debatable. I'm willing to have that debate. I know it's a lot more tricky putting um, uh, uh, titanium on for me anyway. Um, there is the argument that it doesn't uh, have the muscle attaching, but adhesions will still form, because adhesions form when there's blood in the surgical field. That's what causes adhesions and scarring, and of course there'll be adhesions underneath this mesh and in, in this region here. If you want to have more information, if you want it in an easy to read format, then please uh, um, uh, go to this in practice article, which was made at open access thanks to cavalierhealth.org. Uh, if you really want uh, a lot more detail or if you're studying for your boards, then I recommend uh, these two articles, in particular uh, this one at the top which really has all the protocols and a lot more information about other diagnostic imaging. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Claire, and thank you, you know, to everyone and to Claire as well for their patience tonight. We managed at the end to do this uh, great presentation. We're going to take only one question, Claire, just um, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, Christian Gomez um, wanted to ask, you know, most of the study that you've done are morphometric, um, have you considered functional study in terms of electrophysiology, so looking at somatosensory evoked potential, um, cortical or spinal one? I think that that would be a wonderful study, and I look forward to you doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't have, <laughs> I don't have the technology for it, but it would be a very useful um, uh, study. Um, I think that I think the only study that I've done that I haven't published. Mm -hmm. Um, is that I did uh, diffuser tensor imaging of it. I made all the pretty pictures of all the tracks going in different directions, etc. Um, and uh, uh, that was a fun study to do using a very, very sophisticated MRI scan. You may say, why did I not publish it? It was really because it kind of lacked uh, power, um, statistical power uh, for the differences that we saw. And I thought it would be thrown out by the reviewers, so I didn't. Um, maybe um, maybe uh, it would be nice to, to see the pretty images. One of the problems with that, and I think this would be a problem with any kind of study, is that uh, where you had such a big syrinx, it was very difficult to pick out the voxel that actually had the, had the fibres in it. Um, but I think other um, functional studies would be very interesting. I think one of the problems you have is the most interesting for perception of pain. Um, and, and looking at that, and of, and of course, you can't actually ask the dogs whether they're more painful, and those are much more challenging studies. Absolutely. Claire, thank you very much. I think you deserve an extremely large glass of wine for all the trouble. No, I, 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 I don't, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't normally drink uh, on a Thursday I, I night. Think maybe tonight you just... Really large glass of white wine. Maybe tonight you just... <laughs> Just open the bottle and finish it. Um, thank you very much for everyone as well for attending. Um, Claire, um, we hope to see you again at ECVN. Um, your yes. talk, I need to reassure everyone, it will be a different talk on the, another aspect of Siangomalia. It's going to be on the pathophysiology, concentrating on the pathophysiology and on treatment. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Simon. And uh, we hope to see you again in a couple of weeks. Have a good yeah. day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.